Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Theron. I'm the president of the SFU Advocacy for Men and Boys Club, and thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm very excited um, to get this started. First, I'd just like for us to recognize that this event is taking place on unceded indigenous land belonging to the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, unceded means that this land was never surrendered, relinquished, or handed over in any way. Based on our current knowledge, this includes the territories of the Musqueam, uh, Squamish, Stolo, Tsleil-Waututh and other nations. I'd also uh, like to give you guys our club's mission statement. Um, so the SFU AMB supports and promotes individual freedoms of, um, in all of its operations. That is freedom of speech, freedom of choice, freedom of association, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press and intellectual freedom. Beyond supporting and promoting individual freedoms, the SFU AMB assist, desists from the adoption of any particular framework through which to view and address the issues of gender. Instead of providing a prescriptive framework that instructs uh, members of the club and the community at large on how to view and address issues of gender, the SFU AMB instead seeks to serve as a neutral platform of assembly on the basis of a mutual interest in gender and gender equality and exchanging the ideas, opinions and knowledge with honesty, openness and veracity in mind. As you guys obviously know, tonight's event will be on uh, circumcision, uh, medical and feminist critiques on circumcision. And um, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Phil to talk about um, the schedule for tonight. And then he's also going to talk a little bit about our sponsor. Uh, thank you so much for coming out tonight. I am super excited about the presentations. Uh, I think this is going to be really important information and not information we'll forget anytime soon. Uh, so again, my name is Phil Johnston. I'm the president of the Vancouver chapter of the Canadian Association for Equality. I'll just say a few short words about the charity that's sponsoring the event tonight. So uh, CAFE is a registered charity that focuses on gender equality but particularly the inequalities men and boys face in society today. And those are things like uh, lack of resources for male victims of intimate partner violence, high suicide rates, uh, the underachievement of boys in education, uh, issues like circumcision and more. So our advocacy work consists of events on university campuses like tonight and also advertising campaigns. CAFE now has branches across Canada, uh, in Toronto where it began, Ottawa, Montreal, Calgary and Edmonton, and now Vancouver. So uh, one of CAFE's biggest successes has been the establishment of the Canadian Centre for Men and Families. And this was important because not only does it provide counselling services for men and boys and families, but also it uh, provides a haven for male victims of domestic violence, which Canada has not had across the country, save for uh, a small refuge in Winnipeg. Something was set up at a, a homeless shelter there. And I should also give a shout out to, I'm going to butcher their name, but there is the uh, BC... I believe it's male victims of sexual uh, abuse. Uh, here in BC, they also provide services for male victims. So I just want to give a shout out to them. Um, so one of the things that uh, the Vancouver branch wants to do is set up our own center, our own center here for men and families so that we have resources to address issues such as this that we're going to be talking about tonight on a more continual basis. Um, but. And, and your attendance here, I'm, I'm, I'm just so thrilled to see this room filled because I do think this issue is so important. But uh, we also are going to need the help of the community. Um, so after uh, tonight's presentations, uh, there will be um, uh, just a donation jar and an event survey handed out. Uh, any donations you can provide are, are super appreciated. But your time is also valuable to us as well. So if, if you care about these issues and you'd like to make a difference locally, I encourage you to approach myself or Theron, the president of the SFUMB, and we can talk uh, to you about getting involved and or just say hello. I, I love meeting people who care about these issues. So uh, thank you so much for your attention. And I'll just pass it back to the Vice President, Jesse. Without further ado, our first presenter today is uh, Christopher Guest, MD. The subject of his talk will be medical and ethical critiques of circumcision, as well as a bit about the history of the practice. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, well, <clears throat> thank you very much for inviting us to speak tonight. It's a, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to talk to you about this topic. Um, I'm uh, a radiologist. I'm the chief of radiology at uh, the Royal Victoria Regional Health Centre, and uh, my area of medical expertise uh, is not in urology or in uh, circumcision. 
Um, but this is a topic that I've uh, been fascinated with for a few decades now, actually. And, and I think I've developed um, a pretty in-depth understanding uh, of circumcision. And I've spent um, probably about the last 10 years talking to people about uh, this topic. And uh, um, I hope that you'll find it as interesting as I do. Because th the thing that I find interesting about it is, <clears throat> is from an anthropological perspective, it's a very unusual cultural practice that we do. Uh, cutting of the genitalia of children. And, you know, we're going to go through some of the medical arguments for and against circumcision tonight, but when you take the medical arguments out of it, we're, we're left with this, uh, this inconvenient truth that prior to a medical procedure, this was a religious ritual. And it started out as a religious ritual. So my, my main interest lies in understanding how t these types of practices get started and what, uh, what factors are in place to continue to uh, perpetuate them through societies. Now, it's not a balanced talk. Um, I am a strong opponent of circumcision, and uh, I hope uh, that I can convince you of the reasons uh, why I feel that way. And uh, some people in the room may not agree with our point of view, and I think that uh, during the question period, it's important to hear those contradictory point of views as well. So I'd encourage you to uh, certainly ask tough questions and challenges afterwards, because that, that makes it uh, more interesting and more fulfilling for what we, what we are doing as well. Um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of demographics. Now, <clears throat> I use the term intact instead of uncircumcised, and that's a very deliberate uh, term. Uh, the term uncircumcised, it's, it's kind of, it doesn't fit with the rest of medical nomenclature because that term implies that the, that the default position or that the normal state is the post-surgical state, which of course we know is not true. Um, just, just imagine if we called uh, people with breasts unmastectomized or unappendectomized. So it, it's, 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 a, it's a nomenclature of trickery. So intact uh, is a little bit more of a contemporary term and it has a, uh, more positive connotations associated with it. So about 80% of the world's men are intact, uh, uncircumcised. So that's a, a little bit of a, a shocking statistic for North Americans to hear. Um, our, our country in Canada, the year I was born, 1971, 70% uh, of male babies in Canada were circumcised in that year. Uh, but what we've seen now is a complete reversal. So in 2016, about 70% of babies are left intact. So there's been a steady, continual downward trend in circumcision in Canada. Uh, there's never been a year where the incidence of circumcision has gone up uh, compared to the following year. Uh, you look at a country like the United States, where in the 70s and 80s, circumcision was almost universal in that country. It's about 50-50 now. So the incidence has decreased significantly in the U.S. as well. And we see very strong regional differences in the United States. In the Southwest, uh, rates tend to be quite low in the, in the 20s, uh, whereas in the Northeast, the Boston area, the rates are very high, between 80 and 90 percent. So it's very regional depending on what part of the country uh, that you're in. Now, Western Europe is culturally very similar to North America. So you would expect Western Europe's rates to reflect North America. But Actually, nothing's further from the truth. In, in Europe, circumcision is actually very rare. Uh, most European countries have an incidence of circumcision about 5% or less. So that's kind of uh, an eye-opener when people hear that. Uh, a country like England, which was one of the main places in the world where circumcision became established, their hospital circumcision rate now is 3%. So it's, it's pretty unusual in that country. If you just put a big hook down from the sky and just randomly pulled a male off the street in London, it's about a 13% chance that they're, they're circumcised because we're still seeing the dwindling effects of when, when uh, circumcision was, was very common in the 50s and 60s. Countries like France and Italy have rates between 2 and 3%. And, in, and this important thing to understand is in most of these European countries, uh, the vast majority of their populace that practices circumcision are, they do so for religious uh, reasons, uh, religiously mandated reasons. Uh, Finland's an interesting country because it's essentially, it's very legally difficult to obtain a circumcision on a child in Finland. It's almost illegal. So you have a cohort uh, here in Finland with a 0% neonatal circumcision rate. And uh, it's interesting to follow boys in Finland to see, you know, what are, the, what are the odds that they'll actually require a medically necessary circumcision. And we know from the Finnish cohort it's about 1 in 16,000. So it's pretty, it's pretty unusual to have a medical condition which actually requires 
uh, a circumcision. And, and many people think that number is even too high because as physicians in our training, you know, we're, we're sort of, we're trained how to remove the foreskin. We're not very well trained how to care for the, uh, the normal uh, intact penis. Um, then we, we have countries like India and China, uh, China particularly, which has a strong Buddhist uh, historical influence. Uh, and, and Buddhism has strong prohibitions against any type of body mut uh, mutilation or modification. So circumcision really has never existed in China. Um, there are small, there's a small Muslim minority that practice it in China, but for the, for the most part, uh, you have 1.3 billion people and none of them are circumcised. So if you think about that, I mean, Chinese parents don't even struggle with this question because it's never existed culturally for them. And it's, it's interesting to look, you know, what are the public health consequences of having that many people uncircumcised or intact? And I would argue that if, if, if our opponents are correct in that urinary tract infections and sexually transmitted diseases and penile cancer and all these medical scares that we hear about, I mean, there should be dead bodies lying in the streets in China people that have died from diseases of the foreskin. Of course, it's not a public health concern in that country. Uh, same for India and same for Japan. South Korea is a bit of an outlier in Asia. Uh, the incidence of circumcision in, in South Korea is 85%. And uh, uh, this is the, the remnants from the Korean War after the American uh, military operation. And circumcision was promoted as a hygiene measure in, into the poor rural populace in South Korea. Um, I don't know if anyone would like to guess what the average age uh, for circumcision is in, in South Korea. It's 11, 11 years old, which is, uh, which is, which is quite striking when you think about it, right? Um, and it's, it has, you know, this cultural embodiment as a coming of age ritual, uh, but, it, but it, uh, it's certainly different than the practice that you see in, in North America. Uh, Mexico and South America also have very low rates. All of these countries have rates less than 5%. Australia was like us with a relatively high rate, but Australia has actually uh, done better than us now. They have rates less than 20% in that country. And these dark areas are, they all share one thing in common, that circumcision is religiously mandated as part of the religious culture, which is why it's uh, such a common practice in, in those areas. Um, <clears throat> we're just going to start with the history of where this practice came from. So although, although nobody knows the exact uh, place of origin, of uh, circumcision. It's probably originated in many different places at the same time, uh, genital cutting of some type. Uh, our first historical evidence for the presence of, of circumcision comes from ancient Egypt, and it's in the uh, necropolis of Saqqara, which is a, uh, one of the monuments in the Saqqara Valley. Uh, there's a carving on the wall, which basically shows this, this, uh, re, uh, this cartoon depicting it. And the hieroglyphics say, catch him because he will faint. And we know from Egyptian writing that Circumcision was practiced by the priestly caste in ancient Egypt. It was a very important rite of passage for these priests. They entered a higher state of priestliness once they underwent the uh, procedure. And it was most likely a compromise or a substitute for a complete castration. So it was a less severe form of probably a pre-existing type of genital cutting or genital mutilation that was occurring at the time. Um, Things changed for these priests once they underwent the procedure. They, they couldn't eat fish. They had to bathe three times a day. They had to shave their bodies of hair. Uh, and they uh, enjoyed a close personal relationship with the pharaoh, which is you know, a sign of the status that was associated with this uh, procedure. From <clears throat> ancient Egypt, then, the, the practice spread through cultural transference into the Semitic tribes living in the Middle East. And uh, we know that the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Amalekites, the Israelites, the Nabataeans, uh, Phoenicians, these were all cultures living in the Near East at that time that practiced uh, some form of circumcision. Um, a lot of these cultures uh, practiced it though for different reasons. So in the case of the Amalekites, it was, it was used as a, uh, a sign of degradation and humiliation on their prisoners of war. So it had a complete opposite meaning, but the Israelites, on the other hand, it was a, shown as a, a, a sign of tribal distinction, of a tribal marking. Um, so various powerful messages associated with it, but oftentimes the messages were different. Uh, with regards to the Israelites, the practice wasn't as common as you would think initially. And it was around uh, 500 BC uh, where it started to become more common and more ubiquitous across their, their culture. 
And what historians think happened, this was around the time of the captivity in Babylon. The temple was destroyed. The uh, Jewish high priests and philosophers and, and thinkers were basically captured and taken back to Babylon. And when the Persian Empire conquered the entire area, they were much more lenient and they allowed uh, these Jewish thinkers to go back to Jerusalem and to establish a second temple and to build the second temple. And I think when, when the Jewish leaders and the Pharisees reflected on the, the calamity that had just happened, uh, they decided what was needed was a strong unifying marking that would show all the Abrahamic people were cohesive so that it didn't happen again. Um, there were strong political divisions from the Kingdom of Israel in the north and the Kingdom of Judah in the south, and circumcision was thought to be this unifying political symbol that would unite all of the Abrahamic uh, people. So it became much more common and much more mandatory at that stage around 500 BCE. Now we also, we know about the Semitic people's circumcision practices more so from the writings of the ancient Greeks. Uh, because the Greeks were the cultural and military and political uh, superpower of the entire area of the Mediterranean basin. And uh, <clears throat> most of the writing of the Greeks is very negative towards uh, these circumcising cultures. Uh, the Greeks viewed circumcision, the, the Greeks viewed circumcision um, as a uh, barbaric practice. Uh, they thought it uh, was, uh, they, they thought the practice was taking something which in their view was already perfect and somehow uh, distorting it. Um, so there became this strong political message attached to the foreskin uh, among the ancient Greeks. And uh, they, it, it became an example, in their opinion, of the superiority of Greek rationalism over the irrational and superstitious practices of the people living in the Middle East. So there was quite a bit of political connotation around circumcision. They uh, basically forbade anyone who was circumcised from participating in Greek politics, from participating in the military, from participating in the gymnasiums, which were important social places in Greece, and also they weren't allowed to compete in Olympic Games. Um, so most of their depiction of the, of the circumcised penis is, is done in a vulgar, uh, lustful way. So this example of a satire. So this was, this was their opinion that, that the exposed glands was not something that should ever be seen in public. And of course, there, in the ancient Greek society, there was a lot of public nudity. So uh, Jewish people that wanted to participate in Greek politics and, and participate in all this trade and this rich culture uh, developed these type of restoration devices, the Judeus pondulus, which was a weight that was designed to uh, stretch the residual skin back down over the glands of the penis to uh, create the appearance of, of an intact penis. Um, the, there is some pornographic portrayal of the, of the retracted or, or the, you know, the exposed glands in some Greek art, but it's always in a sexual nature. It's never uh, like the previous vulgar image that I show them, which was like more of a comical portrayal. Uh, the Roman <clears throat> Empire inherited so much of the philosophical thinking of the Greeks. Uh, they also inherited their uh, distaste in, uh, for circumcision. And I, th I think that philosophically the Romans thought that it violated the f a fundamental principle of their, of their culture, which was self-determination. Uh, the, the Romans thought that every Roman should be in charge of his own destiny and that circumcision just did not, uh, did not bode well with that uh, philosophical thinking. So at several times throughout the empire, circumcision was actually decreed illegal. And uh, in 95 AD, an emperor named Titus Clemens was actually executed. He was crucified uh, for the crime of circumcising himself. He, he converted to Judaism, but, uh, which was not a crime, but circumcising himself, uh, he, he received the death penalty for that. The other thing that's interesting out of the Roman Empire, as Christianity starts to emerge as the dominant religion, there's all these other competing religions at the time, Mithraism, for instance, uh, which did not require a circumcision. And uh, the early Christian churches were actually competing for pagan converts, Romans that wanted to convert to Christianity. So there was a big debate about whether a Christians needed to become Jewish first, uh, circumcision, and then could become Christians, or whether Roman pagans could just become Christians without uh, undergoing circumcision. And in order to attract more members to the church, you know, this is well debated and well documented, uh, eventually they decided that circumcision was not necessary to become a Christian. And that certainly helped uh, uh, Christianity spread as one of the dominant religions uh, in, the, in the previously occupied Roman areas. 
Uh, it's interesting because at the same time, across the world, the other superpower of the day in ancient China, none of the dynasties, none of the writings, and we have this rich historical evidence and, and all of this, this uh, uh, in-depth writings talking about Chinese culture, there's never any mention of circumcision, never even, never even mentioned as, you know, look what happens in these other parts of the world. It just literally did not exist in that, uh, in that culture ever. I just want to skip a little bit now forward from the fall of the Roman Empire uh, to the Middle Ages. So Moses Maimonides was, <clears throat> he was a uh, Jewish philosopher and, and a uh, physician. He was actually considered probably the most brilliant physician of his day. And he was the uh, personal physician to Salah the uh, uh, Islamic ruler who expelled the Crusaders in the, in the Middle Ages. And uh, this is what he said about circumcision. He said, the purpose of circumcision is to bring about a decrease in sexual intercourse and a weakening of the sexual organ. Circumcision does not perfect what is defective physically, it perfects what is defective morally. The bodily pain caused to that member is the real purpose of circumcision. And although procreation is not rendered impossible, the lust and pleasures beyond which are needed are diminished. So this, this is a Jewish thinker saying, you know, it's not, it's not really about the, it's not, it's not so much really about the commandment, about the, um, the commands in the Torah. He says it's really designed to control sexuality. He, he thought that this was good for the society, the whole pruning of the fruit tree, to try to dull the sexual impulse he thought was a, was a beneficial thing for society. He also said two other interesting things. Uh, first of all, he said that it had to be performed before the eighth day. Um, not because that was the command for the covenant, but because beyond the eighth day, he, he was worried that there would be too much of an emotional attachment between the parents and the child to actually carry it through. So he says, get it done before the eighth day. It becomes too difficult if you wait beyond that. Um, and then the other thing he said was uh, that Jewish women must refrain from sexual relations with, with Christian men, uncircumcised, intact Christian men. And uh, the reason that he, he gave was it would be too difficult for them to then leave those Christian men and marry Jewish men. So this, is, this was his opinion. He thought that there was uh, clearly a sexual advantage if Jewish women were having sexual relations with, uh, with uh, Christian men in, in Europe at the time. Those are interesting insights. Now, of course, other Jewish philosophers had completely different views. Uh, Moses de Leon was a... He was a mystic uh, um, uh, Jewish philosopher who lived in Spain, and he wrote quite a lot about circumcision. And he said, you must know that the uncircumcised nations have no soul except from the side of impurity, for they are immersed in the foreskin. And on account of this, their spirits are impure and filthy. When they remove from themselves this filth, which is the foreskin, their impurity departs. Now, this, this man had a great, great discontent towards Christian Europe at the time, but he uh, is, in this statement, focusing on the foreskin as the, as the source of lust and basically all the impure actions that he perceives uh, uh, Christians in Europe are doing. <clears throat> it goes the other way around as well. Uh, circumcision was a huge source of anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, and, you know, if you were living in the Middle Ages and you're an uneducated, illiterate, Christian and you're afraid of the authority of the church and you're, you're, you're afraid of witches and witchcraft and all of these things, um, circumcision terrifies you because if Jewish parents are willing to do this to their children, they want to do it to my children too. They're going to steal my children and do it to them. And this was a very real fear. Uh, this is the, the murder of Simeon de Trent, a uh, true story of a, of a Christian boy who was found murdered in Trent, Italy, and it just so happened that he was murdered in, in the house of a Jewish family. And uh, this enraged the townspeople. There was a huge pogrom. Uh, all of the Jewish members of the community were uh, gathered. They were imprisoned. Uh, and then 15 of them were actually executed. Uh, they were burned to death. Uh, and the rest of the Jewish community was expelled from this town. And this is the German depiction of that news story. This is from the Chronicles of Nuremberg. This, is from, this piece of parchment is from 1475. It's very old. But what you, what they, how they portray this story, these are all senior leaders of the Jewish faith, and what, what they're doing to Simon is they're, they're circumcising him. And you can see the, the basin below catching the blood. So this was, this was the perception of your average Christian. Jewish people living amongst us want to do this to our children. They want to cut their genitals. They want to catch their blood. So this was just an absolute, just 
uh, it was an absolute uh, conflict waiting to happen, right? This was a stimulus for so much conflict in Europe at the time. In the 1600s, during the Renaissance, the Catholic Church uh, at the Council of Florence decreed circumcision illegal. They declared it immoral, and they said it's a, it's a mortal sin, um, which meant, basically, if you circumcise your child, that you'll go to hell. And this is disguised anti-Semitism. It means if you circumcise your child, i.e. you're Jewish, you will go to hell. So this was an official ruling of the Catholic Church at about the 1600s. The Ref <clears throat> when the Reformation came, uh, things again were, st most of Christian Europe still rejecting circumcision. This is Martin Luther, and he says, in addition to cutting off the foreskin of a male child, the Jews force the skin back on the little penis and tear it open with sharp fingernails, as one reads in their books. Thus they cause extraordinary pain to the child without and against the command of God, so that the father stands there and weeps as his child's cries pierce his heart. We Christians answered roundly that such an abomination is their own invention. Yes, it was inspired by the accursed devil and is in contradiction to God's command. So, <clears throat> where we left it, it's an exclusively religious ritual. It's practiced by a very small minority of people in Europe, and it's not a medical procedure. And we're going to talk a little bit about how it became a medical procedure in, in a second. But I just want to step back a little bit and talk about the anthropology of, of what's going on here. So first of all, um, if it's a tribal marking, why is it on the penis is the first question that I have. Uh, why not an earring or a tattoo or some type of other disfigurement? Why the penis? And I think that the best explanation is because in patriarchal societies, male-dominated societies, the best chance for progeny, for, for carrying on the lineage of your family name, rests on your son's penis, right? That's, that's the future of your gene pool is resting on your son's penis. To bring your son to your community, to your tribe, and say, I'm willing to take this great risk, I'm willing to perform this dangerous thing on my own son to show my devotion to this tribe. I mean, that's a very powerful statement of social cohesion, of, uh, of membership into this, into this tribe. And let's not forget, this, you know, these were procedures done with a sharp rock. This was not done in an operating room. Okay? These were dangerous procedures with a high rate of death and infection and potential for losing the penis and all kinds of other complications. So it was quite a powerful pa statement for a member of the, of the tribe to, to undergo a, um, a procedure like this. The other thing is that <clears throat> in these strong patriarchal societies, what does the circumcised penis resemble? It resembles the sexually aroused intact penis, right? The exposed glands. So there is probably some psychological overlay here that the circumcised penis is showing a state of sexual potency, of sexual virility, of, of constant sexual arousal. So I think these are some of the factors why the practice has developed and continued to be practiced in so many different societies and different places. Now, I'm not a doctor of history, but I am a doctor of medicine, so I'm going to go into the science of this, which is the area that I understand the most. So <clears throat> this is uh, uh, what a natural, intact penis looks like. And we talk about circumcision's removal of the foreskin. Well, what, what is the foreskin? You know, is, is the foreskin, is it, does it have an anatomical location? And, and the answer is no. The foreskin is just part of the normal skin covering of the penis. Okay? We give it a specific name. We say, you know, we're going to remove the foreskin, but we just invent that name to say we removed that part of the penis. Okay? But technically, it's a mucocutaneous junction, and that means uh, a part of the body where skin transitions into specialized mucosal surface. So the other place w would be a mucosal uh, cutaneous junction would be your eyelids, for instance. Skin on the outside, specialized mucosa on the inside. That's histologically what the foreskin is. It's a double-sided structure. <clears throat> the, the inner surface, the undersurface of the foreskin, is probably one of the most heavily innervated parts of the human body. Okay? Um, it contains specialized nerve receptors called Meissner's corpuscles and Raffini endings. And these are very, very, very sensitive uh, nerve endings. The other place in uh, the human body where they're, they're very numerous is in the fingertips as well. 
So if you wonder why the tips of your fingers are so much more sensitive than, say, the back of your hand, it's the presence of these corpuscular nerve endings. And it's very rich, the inner surface of the, of the uh, foreskin. You'll also see this dark, sorry, this, this reddish area, uh, which is the capillary bed, which has to supply an enormous amount of blood to this complex uh, neurosensory platform. Because there are so many nerve endings, there needs to be a lot of blood supply in there. That's why there's this reddish hue to that part of the, uh, of the foreskin. And this area right here is this ridged area is called the ridged band. This is where the highest concentration of nerve endings are located uh, on the penis. Now, circumcision removes everything from this blue line, which is where the head of the penis is, the coronal sulcus, down to this green line, and then also on the undersurface back to the blue line. Okay? So, as the penis becomes erect, the foreskin retracts starts to pull back and it everts and it exposes this sensitive area that I just talked about. So in essence, circumcision removes everything from this blue line down to the green line and then to the head of the penis. So all of this tissue is removed at circumcision. Because don't forget, the child has a small penis and the penis will grow about 30 times larger if it's, if it's allowed to develop normally. So removing a small amount of tissue from the pediatric penis actually has big consequences in terms of how much of the surface area of the skin is actually removed from the penis. So it's about, this is about 50% of the surface area skin of the penis is removed uh, in a typical circumcision. There are probably other specialized functions of the foreskin that haven't been properly studied. For instance, there are sebaceous glands uh, which probably produce some type of pheromone. Uh, we know from studies on rats that the uh, that the exposed uh, foreskin can actually stimulate a state of estrus in some rats. So it, this has never been studied in humans, but it's hypothesized that that's the function of the sebaceous glands. Um, and also some scientists have identified estrogen receptors on the uh, inner surface, again, the specialized mucosa. Nobody has any good explanation of why estrogen receptors would be present uh, in this uh, area. The, the tip of the penis actually is innervated with something called piscinian corpuscles. That's these green things right here, okay? So in a cross-section piece of skin, the piscinian corpuscles are located down deep. They're sensitive to deep pressure, to vibration. It's the Meissner's corpuscles, these yellow things, which are really close to the surface of the skin. That's why they're so sensitive. They're, they're literally right at the surface of the skin. This is an h and &E section, a histological section through the foreskin. And this is the Meissner corpuscle right here, this specialized nerve ending. And you can see how close it is to the surface of the skin. The surface of the skin is literally just a couple cell layers away right here. Okay. When you look at these in a higher magnification, they're actually like a spring. So not only is it sensitive to temperature and to movement, it's also sensitive to stretching, which is one of the reasons why it's the movement of the foreskin back and forth which stimulates this type of nerve receptor. So, um, so what does that mean, removing that tissue from the penis? Well, this is a direct comparison on the left. This is a circumcised penis. On the right, this is the intact penis, okay? I want you to notice a few differences first. So the first difference is the color of the glands or the head. On the circumcised penis, the glands is very similar in appearance to the skin on the shaft of the penis, okay? That is not normal anatomy. You'll notice on the intact penis, it's more of a purple hue, okay? It's a lot smoother, it's a lot more supple tissue, and it's a different color than the skin on the rest of the penis. What's happened here is removing the protective covering of the glands, it's externalized what is meant to be an internal structure, okay? It's taken away the protective covering of the glands. So this is a process called keratinization where there's a thickening or overgrowth of more skin layers. So if you look at autopsy studies, the, the epidermis, that top layer of skin, it's about eight times thicker on the circumcised penis than it is compared to the intact penis, which is further resulting in decreased sensitivity, the extra uh, thickening of the epidermis. The other thing is this dark band here. That is not a normal anatomical structure, okay? That is the circumcision scar. And when it's dark brown like this, it's almost always the, the result of a gomical clamp, one of the uh, mechanical devices that's used to crush off the foreskin. Um, when you look at this area under microscope, there's an overgrowth of Schwann cells, which are a type of, of, uh, 
of nerve uh, ending. And it's a pathological reaction to, to severing so many nerves. So you get an overgrowth of, of neural tissue in that, in that region. And certainly if you ask most circumcised men, they will say that the most sensitive and pleasurable part of the penis is between the circumcision scar and the head of the penis. They won't say the head of the penis, they'll say between here and here. And the reason why is because that was the previous location of the foreskin. Circumcision has removed the most sensitive part of the penis. So you can test for this. And this middle picture is the seams Weinstein monofilament. And these are little hair-like filaments that can apply very, very light pressures. And uh, this study uh, from Sorrells was a urologist in San Francisco who he basically mapped out uh, different locations on the penis to try to determine where the most sensitive areas are located. On the left, this is the intact penis, and you can see that the most sensitive areas have these bright colors, red, purple. There's a lot more of these sensitive areas on the intact penis compared to the circumcised penis. Okay? If you look at the actual pressure threshold values, so the light bar graphs are the readings on the intact men, and the dark bar graphs are the readings on the circumcised men. And these are all, the, 1 to 19, these are all the different spots that they tested, okay, on the penis. And the lower the pressure threshold, the more sensitive it is, okay? So that these, these areas, they can feel the really, really tiny ones, the ones that you can barely see with, you, with the naked eye. So the lowest readings are in this area right here. Number three, that is the ridged band, that area that I showed you earlier. That has the lowest pressure threshold of any of the other areas on the penis. And we don't see a dark band beside that light bar graph because those areas have been amputated on the circumcised male. So he's, the, the circumcised male is missing all of these sensitive areas. Okay. Location eight, this is the head of the penis, the glands. It's on the intact penis, it still is lower. It has a lower pressure threshold. It's more sensitive compared to the head of the penis of a circumcised subject. And then the most sensitive area for the circumcised subject is this area right here, which is the uh, circumcision scar. But it is still not as sensitive as the ridged band, which is number three. So this, this is showing, by mapping out all of these areas tediously on, on many subjects, that uh, circumcision has removed the most sensitive areas of the penis. So <clears throat> we're going to talk a little bit about the consequences of that in a second, but I just want to also bring your attention to the mechanical function of the foreskin. And it's, it's unbelievable that you can ask 100 physicians, and I guarantee you 99 of them have no idea about this. Okay? And I guarantee you that some of the intact physicians won't know about this. But the, the, the foreskin acts as a linear bearing mechanism. It decreases friction in a linear direction. Okay? By the folding and unfolding on itself, some of the forward pressure is translated through the movement of the foreskin. Uh, it's been described as a, as a sheath moving inside of another sheath. Okay? On the outward motion during sexual intercourse, in number one, the foreskin kind of bunches up and it forms a gasket and it seals the external opening of the vaginal vault. And that sealing prevents any vaginal lubricants from being pulled out. Okay? Whereas imagine the circumcised penis, the coronal hook of the head would actually just pull lubricants out of the vagina. So the fact that the foreskin seals and acts as a gasket, it's the male's contribution to lubrication during sexual intercourse. And on the inward motion, what happens is the foreskin, it everts and it exposes all of that sensitive uh, tissue that we've talked about to the vaginal mucosa as well. So you have the most sensitive areas of the male uh, genitals lining up with the most sensitive areas of the female genitals. That's the normal state. Um, and I mean, does this surprise anyone? Does it surprise anyone that the, the, the two sexes of our species have co-evolved to work perfectly like this? That's exactly what you would expect through the process of evolution. Now, <clears throat> I told you that the sensitive areas are removed. Does that translate to decreased sexual pleasure? And you can find studies um, all over the place uh, that uh, try to look at that question. And it's a very, I mean, it's a very subjective thing to try to quantify sexual pleasure. So you can imagine how hard of a trial that is to design. And the studies are quite honestly conflicting and they're biased and it depends on what part of the world they're coming from. This study happens to come from Denmark, which is a non-circumcising culture. And, and basically the study shows increased sexual difficulties in 
uh, males who have been circumcised, and also increased sexual difficulties in the female partners of circumcised men. But uh, there are just as many studies that show the opposite, and there's just as many studies that show um, uh, that there's been no effect. So when we are confronted with conflicting biased evidence, I think it's important to say, well, what's the most reasonable conclusion? So I ask you, do you do removing all of that sensitive nerve tissue from the penis, do you think that's more likely to increase sexual pleasure? Or do you think removing all that sensitive neural tissue from the penis is more likely to decrease sexual pleasure? I mean, based on everything we know about neuroanatomy and the nervous system, what, what, what would you guess is more likely? Like, I'm going to say decrease sexual pleasure. Um, <clears throat> now, the other, the other thing is a good analogy for this because you hear it all the time. I mean, people say, I'm circumcised and I'm fine. Sex is very pleasurable for me. Therefore, circumcision must be okay, right? That, that's a very common argument. And I, I think the, the best analogy is imagine your favorite piece of music, okay, a, a Mozart symphony. And you've heard this piece many times. You love it. It's your favorite piece. It's very beautiful. But for some reason, you don't get to hear it with the violas, okay? The viola section has been removed, but it's still your favorite piece of music, right? Um, how do you know you wouldn't like it better with the violas. Uh, why wouldn't you want to hear it with the violas? Don't you think it should be your choice if you want to hear it with the violas or not? Okay, so the violas here are the foreskin. <clears throat> Turn now to some evolutionary uh, perspectives. Um, there is absolutely no doubt among any scientists in the world that our current bodies are the result of evolution through natural selection. And uh, the currency of natural selection, the way it works on a mechanical level, is differential reproductive success, which basically means that if you leave more offspring than the other guy, the species will start to look more like you, right? Differential reproductive success. In such a system, the, does it make sense for the actual organ of reproduction to be defective? or to have inefficient design, or to be prone to disease. With such a system, the only thing that matters is how many offspring you leave. It doesn't matter how strong you are, or how smart you are, or how fast you are, or how fast you can climb trees. The only thing that matters from a Darwinian perspective is the number of children that you've left. And that's the body that we now see in our species. So because the foreskin is a certain way, because the penis is a certain way, that is the design which has resulted in the best reproductive efficiency. Um, Richard Dawkins says it the best. He says, evolution is a miserly accountant, counting the pennies, watching the clock, punishing even the smallest inefficiency. Evolution does not tolerate frivolous design or redundancy. Ruthless utilitarianism always trumps. Okay? It's not just our species as well. If you look at every mammal species, there is an anatomical equivalent of the foreskin. So if you think about that, um, the divergence of mammals over the last 100 million years. So we have blue whales, we have cheetahs, we got <coughs> chimpanzees, bats. These are all mammals, they all have foreskins, okay? Bats have evolved wings and still maintain their foreskin structure. Whales have blowholes and tails, they have a foreskin, okay? So to see the persistence of an anatomical structure in so many different divergent mammal lines is evidence of the efficacy or the benefit of that structure. It's very similar to our spinal column, how it's present in so many different species. Now, <clears throat> if, uh, if human beings, people have heard this before, if human beings have evolved from apes, then why are there still apes, right? People have heard that from the anti-evolutionary argument. And I think it's not so much that we have evolved from apes, but we are apes, okay? Human beings are the fourth ape species. We are tall, hairless, bipedal African apes. And because we are apes, we share a common ancestry with other African apes, uh, chimpanzees, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans. And um, most of the fossil record, most of uh, comparative anatomy and uh, molecular biology show that that common ancestor that we shared with chimpanzees was about five million years ago, okay? We also share a common ancestor with more distant 
primate relatives, such as chimpanzees, uh, sorry, sorry, as, uh, rhesus monkeys and spider monkeys, so other monkeys. And that distant ancestor is about 15 to 20 million years ago. It's more distant, but we do share a common ancestor with them as well. When you compare the penises of humans with these primate ancestors, when you compare it to the monkeys, for instance, our more distant ancestor, you'll see that most of the innervation of, the, of their penis is on the head of the penis, okay? So most of their corpuscular neuroreceptors are located on the head of the penis with very little neuroreceptors on the inner foreskin. Monkeys have a very short copulatory time, okay, seconds. And there's absolutely no paternal investment in the offspring. The males contribute sperm, nothing else. The most males never meet their offspring, have nothing to do with their offspring. Chimpanzees have much more innervation on the inner foreskin with relatively less innervation on the head of the penis. Chimpanzees have a longer copulatory time and they invest much more resources, the, 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 the paternal the males ingest, invest much more resources raising the young and protecting the young in chimpanzees. Human beings are the extreme example. We have almost all of our innervation on the inner foreskin with very little innervation on the head of the penis. We have the longest copulatory times of any uh, primate and we have the most paternal investment in caring for the young. Um, my daughter's turning 14, I'm still looking after her. So I'm, I'm a better dad than a rhesus monkey. but. Um, <laughs> But wh why is this important? This is, this is a lot of information, but it, basically this trend, it shows that the heavily innervated foreskin, it is a sign of evolutionary advancement from the lower primate species. It's not some vestigial leftover structure. It's something that's evolved specifically. As you get closer to humans, you see it along the chain of other primates. And people say, well, well who, why? A key bono, who benefits? Why, why does this exist? Every evolutionary, uh, observation has to have a benefactor. And <clears throat> people think the longer copulatory times probably contribute to more pair bonding between the males and females of our species. Uh, the increased pair bonding probably makes it more likely for the male to stick around and uh, to offer some protection and resources for the raising of the offspring. So this is probably one of the reasons why the <laughs> foreskin has evolved with such rich innervation is in order to prevent more pair bonding between males and females instead of making uh, sex, just this quick mechanical deposition of sperm and egg meeting, okay? That's, that's been the, the evolutionary uh, theory that's been proposed to try to explain these anatomical uh, differences. I'm not going to show this video. Now, um, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the medicalization of circumcision because the last time we left it, uh, Europe was generally against circumcision with just a very small uh, religious minority practicing it. About the turn, about the 1850s, 1860s, during the Victorian era, uh, some of the top physicians of the day were absolutely convinced that uh, masturbation was causing uh, disease in children, that it was a significant cause of disease in children. So, uh, and this, you know, very well intentioned, uh, but, but completely misguided and completely unscientific, they, they started to promote circumcision as a way of stopping children from masturbating, to, hope, to hopefully prevent some type of disease down the, down the road. And uh, they took this very seriously. Um, and, uh, and the papers, you know, the papers are very clear about why they're doing this. They, they, they said because circumcision, it decreases sexual pleasure and it takes away the gliding mechanism of the penis, which is making children masturbate because it's so easy to do so. So circumcision should decrease the uh, frequency of masturbation, and of course it, it doesn't, as every kid in the ninth grade will tell you, right? Um, but that's what they thought, and, and, and they, it was well-intentioned but completely misguided. <clears throat> the other thing is that, so, so in society, what was traditionally seen as a Jewish ritual started to become perceived as a issue of cleanliness and sexual um, restraint, sexual continence, um, and these were things that were favored by this, this uh, sexually repressed Victorian society. Um, and this wasn't for free. This, cost, this costed uh, uh, money. And uh, because it was expensive, it became also associated as a sign of socioeconomic status, of wealth. If you could afford to provide this beneficial thing for your child, 
uh, which is going to be in their best interest and prevent all these diseases, then you, then you obviously were upper class, right? So it became associated with wealth in Victorian society. Once it became established, and it <clears throat> actually didn't take long to become established, probably about 20 to 30 years, it was, it was very, very common. People were starting to question the efficacy of it preventing masturbation. Um, here's one of the pioneers. Uh, this is J. Harvey Kellogg. Uh, he was the, uh, him and his brother invented cornflakes. And uh, he was an uh, absolute anti-masturbation crusader. And uh, he, wrote, he wrote an entire book uh, about masturbation. It's called Treatment of Self-Abuse and Its Effect, Plain Facts for the Old and Young. And uh, in this book, he specifically said that uh, if children are caught masturbating, that uh, for boys, uh, circumcision should be performed without any anesthetic because the pain that's associated with the surgery will be a good reminder of them. Punishment will be associated with the procedure. So definitely don't use anesthetic and make sure that it's directly linked to, to uh, the fact that they were caught masturbating. Uh, and then for girls, um, he recommended applying carbolic acid to the clitoris um, because he thought this was the best way to stop little girls from masturbating. And all this is, you know, for the child's health, right? Uh, but uh, very serious writings, very uh, well-respected physician at the time. So as people started to question its effect on masturbation, what we see is a bunch of other a priori medical justifications starting to pop up. Well, if it's not good for masturbation, maybe it is good for this, or maybe it helps prevent this disease, maybe it presents this disease. And I just want to show you some of the studies. These are all actual published medical studies in mainstream medical literature for the day. So in 1845, this physician said it cures masturbation. In 1855, it prevents syphilis. In 1865, it prevents epilepsy. 1870, spinal paralysis. Bedwetting. Scoliosis, paralysis of the bladder, clubfoot. Nocturnal emissions, abdominal neuralgia. I like this one. It cures all eye problems. Not some of them, all of them, right? It cures all eye problems. Blindness, deafness, and dumbness. And this, of course, this is the best one. Circumcising blacks prevents them from raping white women. Okay? And if you, anyone would like to you know, pull out this little gem, here's the reference right there. You can, you can get it out. The, this is an interesting article, and I would in, actually encourage you to read it. Uh, other than being incredibly racist and unscientific and stupid, um, the article talks a lot about what they perceive as the anatomical susceptibility of blacks, why they always are raping these white women. And they say it's their foreskin. They say that the centers of lust are in the foreskin and, and it seems to be overdeveloped in blacks. Therefore, that's why circumcision makes sense. But, you know, they seem to place the blame entirely on this source of sexual pleasure, which is interesting. Uh, rectal incontinence, tuberculosis, penile cancer, prostate cancer, prostate cancer, venereal disease, cancer of the tongue, cervical cancer. What does the Canadian Pediatric Society say? So this is the most recent statement from 2015. And their <clears throat> statement is, the Canadian Pediatric Society does not recommend the routine circumcision of every newborn male. <coughs> that would have been good. They could have stopped talking there. But they didn't. They then said, healthcare professionals should provide the most up-to-date, unbiased, and personalized medical information so that parents can weigh the specific risks and benefits of circumcising their son in context of familial, religious, and cultural beliefs. So, religious and cultural beliefs. So, should parents be doing this with their daughters as well, based on their religious and cultural beliefs, right? Uh, should this Canadian Pediatric Society, a scientific medical society, be recommending surgery based on the religious and cultural beliefs of their parents. Should a parent be able to walk into an office and say, remove my son's finger uh, because Poseidon, uh, it shows my devotion to Poseidon, right? Um, so I think that when it's a medical society making recommendations based on the parent's religion 
as, as what, in terms of whether surgery is indicated, we have a big problem here. Okay. I have a suggestion for them, which this might be a little bit of a better position statement. It's the most brutal fucking thing we've ever seen. <laughs> Done. The procedure is the most common surgical procedure in the world. You would expect my profession to get pretty good at it if we're circumcising 20% of the world, right? Um, so I'm not going to show the horror show. Um, and of course, bad complications occur. Deaths occur every year. People children die from circumcision, but there's some subtle complications that a lot of patients don't even know that they actually suffered from. This is called an adhesion or a synechiae. And this is basically where uh, after the foreskin was removed, the remaining skin actually adhered a little bit to the glands or the head of the penis and it created this linear scar. And a lot of uh, patients have this and don't even realize it, right? But it can, in some instances, lead to pain and deformity and curvatures of the penis as well. Uh, this is an example of meatal stenosis, which is a, a process exclusively seen in circumcised babies, which is an inflammation and scarring of the very tip of the, of the urethra. And it can sometimes make uh, urinating difficult and, and uh, cause some urinary retention. It's treated by using a series of pons dilators to actually stretch the opening. Um, and then this is one of the horrible things that can happen. This is uh, a cautery injury that's uh, that uh, conducted into the gomco clamp and actually burned the entire penis and this child lost his penis. He's lucky he didn't lose his life. Um, what about the medical benefits? I showed you all of the crazy medical arguments from years gone by, but of course we have much more respectable and contemporary medical arguments now that have been proposed uh, for circumcision, uh, including penile carcinoma, uh, human papilloma virus preventing urinary tract infections and sexually transmitted diseases. Most pediatric medical associations uh, in the world disagree that circumcision is beneficial for preventing these diseases. Um, but I would like to take a different approach. I would, let's assume that circumcision is effective at preventing these diseases. Let's say it's 100% effective at preventing these diseases, okay? Let's take it from that perspective. What does that mean? Well, the incidence of penile carcinoma is one in 250,000, okay? As a man, you're more likely to die from breast cancer than you are from penile cancer, okay? You would have to perform 250,000 circumcisions on babies to prevent one case of penile cancer, which typically, typical onset of penile cancer 84 years old, okay? 250,000 surgeries to prevent one case of circumcision. So, sorry, one case of penile cancer. Um, statistically, you're more likely to die of lightning striking you than you are from penile cancer, okay? But we hear this term, this is, you know, it's great. It's a preventative measure. It could prevent penile carcinoma. The American Cancer Society has def their definitive statement is that there's no protective effect of circumcision preventing penile carcinoma. Human papillomavirus and cervical cancer, well, we have a vaccine now uh, against HPV. It's not a perfect vaccine. It's not 100% effective, but um, it's a step in the right direction. And I think that instead of um, performing surgery on children in order to protect future sexual partners that they may or may not have is unethical. The child may grow up to be gay. The child may grow up to be a priest. The child may grow up to be in a monogamous relationship. And it makes no sense that we should be performing surgery on <coughs> child A to protect future child B, their sexual partner. Um, certainly the more ethical approach is just to keep improving the vaccine um, and early detection of cervical can through, cancer through uh, pap smears and et cetera. Uh, urinary tract infections also really makes no sense. Now, this one I will concede, there probably is a very small benefit of having, uh, uh, in terms of circumcision preventing urinary tract infections. And there's a, there's a change in the bacterial <coughs> growth that occurs in the meatus, which may make this slightly uh, protective. Um, but what is the incidence of urinary tract infections? It's one in 186, okay? So that's 186 circumcisions to prevent one urinary tract infection. And I could cure it with $15 of ciprofloxacin, antibiotics. Okay. <coughs> so uh, that's uh, uh, not indicated. And if you look at countries in the world that don't really practice circumcision, like Japan and China, um, you know, where are these dialysis units filled with children in renal failure from unrecognized urinary tract infections? They don't exist. They're not big public health concerns 
in these countries. It's not cost effective. And the number needed to, to derive benefit is too high, in my opinion, one in 186. <coughs> uh, sexually transmitted disease, this intuitively makes sense. If you've removed the mucosal surface, there's less of an entryway for bacteria and viruses to get into the body. Uh, possibly, you know, removing some of the penile tissue may decrease the chances of sexually transmitted disease. The problem is that larger demographic uh, trends in the world don't support this, okay? So if you look at a country like Sweden, uh, where almost nobody is circumcised, and you compare it to the United States, where, where the majority of males are circumcised, uh, Sweden beats the U.S. on every measurable parameter of sexual health. health. They have a lower gonorrhea incidence, they have a lower chlamydia incidence, they have a lower herpes incidence, they have a lower uh, syphilis incidence, and they have a lower HIV incidence. Uh, the United States has a 42 times higher syphilis rate than Sweden. It has an 11 times higher HIV rate than Sweden. It has a three times higher heterosexual HIV transmission rate than Sweden. So Sweden beats the US on every single one of these measurable parameters. So if, if there is <clears throat> any protective effect at all, it's obviously overshadowed by behavioral factors. And you know, I, I, I think that instead of circumcising children, we should be sending them to Sweden for Swedish sex education, right? Because clearly they're doing something that North Americans are not uh, doing as well. So it is truly the cure looking for a disease. Now, HIV, though, is a separate topic uh, because this is, <clears throat> this is the most recent public health concern. If you look at, you know, since the 1850s onward, whatever the pressing public health problem of the day is, circumcision has been advocated as a potential cure for that problem. Uh, whether it was masturbation, whether it was neurological disorders, uh, you know, scoliosis and, and uh, uh, musculoskeletal disorders, then it became uh, sexually transmitted diseases, and when antibiotics came around, then it became cancer. Whatever has preoccupied phys physicians and public health experts during that particular period of history, circumcision's always pulled out as, well, maybe it cures this, maybe, it's, maybe this is what it's for, right? And I think HIV is the next, ev ev next step in that trend. Um, everything came to the forefront when three trials were conducted in Africa, and uh, one was conducted in Uganda, one in Kenya, and one in South Africa. And <clears throat> what these trials showed was that circumcising men in these defined populations decrease the chance of female to male HIV transmission. And these studies were uh, powerful studies in terms of their size and how they were uh, protocoled. They were a randomized controlled trial where half of the males were circumcised and half of them were left intact. And then they just, you know, followed them. And at two years' time, they looked and, and, and assessed which, uh, uh, which of these groups had the most uh, rates of HIV infection. And I'll show you the results from these trials, but it's important to note that each one of these lead authors is not an infectious disease HIV expert, okay? Overe, Bailey, and Gray, these are circumcision proponents. These are authors who have published over 100 separate articles um, about the benefits of circumcision for other uh, medical conditions. So these, these, these weren't public health people saying, how can we address this, this uh, uh, terrible epidemic in Africa? These were Western circumcision proponents looking to export circumcision to the world's uh, poorest and least educated people. Uh, and, and probably to do so in order to justify its continuation in North America. Okay. Works over here, wouldn't it be better if, if we did this to our children here? So the news always says it's a 50% reduction in relative risk. If you, these studies show that if you circumcise your child, you've decrease their chances of catching HIV by 50%. That's, that's always the bottom line that the newspapers say. Well, here are the exact numbers. So the red numbers are the actual um, cases of HIV. So in the South African trial, after two years, 45 cases of HIV in the intact group and only 20 in the circumcised group. And the trend is pretty similar here, 45, half the number in the circumcised group. Uh, Kenya, about the same, half the number. So it looks like it's true, it decreases the chances of uh, contracting HIV by 50%. But that's the relative risk. The absolute risk is not quite as impressive. So it's 45 out of 1,582, which is about 2.84% of the intact subjects contracted HIV. 1.3% of the circumcised 
subjects contracted HIV. So the actual, the absolute difference is 1.6%, okay? It's very, very small. So after two years, the chance that you've decreased your risk of HIV infection by 1.6% overall, okay? So it's much less impressive. It's not as, doesn't sell as many newspapers and it doesn't sell as many circumcisions in North America, which is one of the reasons we don't see the absolute risk reduction as well. Now, <clears throat> the, some of the flaws, the methodological flaws with these studies, um, they're, they're too numerous to go over, but I'll point out a few of them. First of all, there was a lead time bias. So uh, they circumcised half of the group, and they couldn't have sex for six to eight weeks while they recovered from their surgery. Okay? They were out of commission, so to speak, whereas the intact group had an extra two and a half months uh, to potentially contract HIV. And these studies, all of them showed that the highest uh, rates of HIV contraction were early on in the study, within the first three to four months. So um, you have a lead time bias here because the intervention group, the circumcised group, has two to three less months to get HIV. They didn't correct for that. They did not correct for the percentage of female sex workers living in the counties where these men lived. That's the single greatest risk factor for contracting HIV in Africa is the percentage of females who are in the uh, sex trade. Uh, in the county that you live in. Um, they did not contract, they didn't, they didn't um, consider the per exposure risk. So one individual may have contacted HIV after one sexual encounter. One may have contracted HIV after 250 sexual encounters. They didn't control for that, okay? So they didn't look at how many sexual partners and actually how many sexual encounters the HIV positive subjects actually had. So there's variability there as well. Um, they didn't control for malaria. Uh, malaria is the single greatest factor for HIV viral load in the bloodstream of uh, people who are infected. People that have malaria have much higher viral uh, loads, are much more likely to pass uh, HIV on to their sexual partners. And the worst criticism for this trial is after two years, they say, well, these results are so compelling, it must be beneficial, it's unethical for us to continue the study. We have to offer circumcision to the intact group now. We have to close the study and circumcise everybody because it's unethical if we don't do that. So that's after two years with a 1.6% <laughs> decreased chance of getting HIV. They could have followed these men for five years, 10 years, 15 years, and seen, you know, are the results durable? Uh, but they stopped the studies after two years. So the fact that the, the early closure really uh, took away the chances for the, for the um, statistics to really balance out. Um, now, if, excuse me, now if, if you believe the numbers, <clears throat> this, the authors of the studies themselves have said, well, these, these numbers are still very high because even in the circumcised group, a 1.3% chance of ca catching HIV in two years, that's enormous compared to our risk as North Americans, okay? So there's still a very high rate of, of HIV transmission in, in the circumcised group here in Africa. So the authors said, well, this is not good enough on its own. They ha everybody has to use condoms as well, okay? So they said, you know, it's very good. We're happy with the results, but it's only useful if you use condoms every single time you have sex. So that was their conclusion in, after these trials. So, so they said, you know, use a condom every time you have sex or cut off part of your penis and use a condom every time you have sex. That was their conclusions, the authors of these, of these studies. And then, of course, now we see uh, circumcision has become this fashionable status trend in Africa. It's perceived as uh, Western. Uh, it's perceived as uh, scientifically uh, valid. So you see these uh, billboards popping up. I'm proud I have a circumcised husband because we have less chance of getting HIV. Um, physician transference. Um, Physicians are humans like everybody else. We are prone to our biases and our, and our prejudices. And uh, this is an interesting study that was done in the University of Saskatchewan. They asked family doctors uh, about their, uh, what they recommend to parents about circumcision. Uh, are they in favor of it or are they against it? And they also asked these family doctors a bunch of personal questions, their sexual orientation, their age, they asked them their own circumcision status as well. 
And what the, the results of this study showed, about 80% of the physicians thought that they were making the recommendation to parents based on their best scientific assessment of the evidence. They're based, they made their recommendation based on science. And when they actually looked at the numbers, 75% of the circumcised physicians recommended for circumcision. 75% of the intact physicians recommended against circumcision. So you can see the physician bias here, right? Um, and I would imagine, I don't think there's any evidence for this, but there was probably similar type of bias among female physicians based on the circumcision status of their, of their partners and their children as well. So, uh, so yeah, it, it comes through. It comes through in, in the way uh, physicians recommend uh, and, and advocate towards parents. Um, just quickly, I'm going to touch on uh, circumcision and medical ethics. There are many medical ethicists who believe that uh, forced infant circumcision uh, violates some of the core principles of, of medical ethics. Uh, primum non nocere is a concept of first do no harm. And it's a bit, it's a bit more complicated than it sounds. It, it says that if, the, if there is pathology present, there's some type of medical condition, and the physician is considering an intervention or a surgery, the physician must always weigh the potential for harm of doing the surgery against the potential for harm of not doing the surgery. And if there's significant imbalance, if the potential harm for not doing the surgery significantly outweighs the potential side effects that can occur, then they should do the surgery. So circumcision fails this ethical test because first of all, there is no pathology present, right? The foreskin is not a disease process, it's normal anatomy. But secondly, the potential for harm greatly, greatly exceeds the potential for doing nothing. If you don't do the surgery, then they end up like every Chinese and Japanese <laughs> baby and they live a normal, healthy life for the most part. If you do the surgery and you have a significant complication, they could die, right? Or they could uh, have all kinds of miserable dysfunction and, and uh, disfigurement if it, goes, uh, if it goes badly. And I would argue they would have functional impairment even if, the, if the, there is no complication based on what we talked about earlier in terms of the function of the foreskin. Uh, autonomy is a much easier concept to understand. It's, it, you know, you may choose to remove part of your penis if you want, but you may not remove part of my penis, right? Uh, or mm -hmm. any other person who doesn't provide their full consent for this procedure. And since children are too young to provide informed consent, uh, this violates, it violates their uh, uh, rights to autonomy. Now, people have argued <coughs> surrogate autonomy, that mm -hmm. parents can sometimes make surrogate decisions for their children. But in those instances, uh, when surgery is, is at stake, uh, those are instances of medical urgency, where the babies could potentially die or life or limb type of situations. Then the, then the parents are expected to make surrogate uh, decisions, but not in a, in a relatively cosmetic procedure like circumcision. They have no right to make that decision. And proportionality is, uh, is the morbidity associated with a treatment, is it in proportion to the morbidity associated with the disease process? If anyone's ever had conjunctivitis red eye, uh, a, a, a treatment that is 100% effective for curing conjunctivitis is removing the eyeball. It cures it every time, right? But it fails the test of proportionality because it's too invasive, it's too destructive, it's too extreme. If you have a retinoblastoma, a malignant tumor in your eyeball, and the, tr the treatment is to remove it, then it passes the test of proportionality because they're, they're more in line with, uh, with one another. And circumcision fails this test. Uh, you could think about urinary tract infections. There is less destructive and less invasive ways to prevent a urinary tract infection <coughs> than removing genital tissue from children. So it, it obviously fails the test of proportionality. Now, this is trespassing a little bit on Kira's topic, um, but there are certainly uh, grave uh, human rights concerns around circumcision. And um, I would just point out that we, we have a little bit of a cultural blind spot when it comes to genital cutting because we live in a culture that practices male genital cutting. It's normal to us, it makes sense to us, it's perceived as hygienic and socially beneficial to our uh, sons. And, um, but female genital cutting strikes us as very different and uh, barbaric and with different intent. 
And I don't mean to equate the two because they are very different from one another. Um, but there are some similarities that need to be pointed out. And the first thing is cultures that practice female genital cutting don't do so to be cruel. Okay? They do so because they believe it's in the best interest of their daughters. Uh, they think it's cleaner, it looks better, it's going to lead to um, more social acceptance, it's going to lead to them having a more uh, happy marriage, that, those type of things. So they believe it's in the best interest of their children, which is similar to uh, the practice of male circumcision. Um, it's also, it's or originated as a way of controlling and decreasing sexuality, very similar to uh, male circumcision as well. So the practices probably are uh, more similar than they are different. And one of the things that Kira will touch on is that everyone assumes the worst case of female genital cutting and the best case of male genital cutting. And I mean, there's, there's much more mutilating forms of male genital cutting. There's a sub-incision, which is basically filleting the penis open uh, so that the urethra is completely open along the bottom of the penis, looks like a butterfly. And uh, this is practiced by some tribal uh, cultures in South Africa. Uh, but we assume only one form of genital cutting. And there are much less invasive and destructive forms of female genital cutting. Right now, it is illegal to take a pin and to prick the clitoris of a baby girl. It's illegal in theory in every country on earth, okay? But it's perfectly legal for a rabbi with no medical training whatsoever to uh, cut off the foreskin and then suck on the penis afterwards. That, that's completely legal, okay? So there is um, the legal framework that exists right now to protect male children if as a society we choose to do so. Uh, and a lot of this legal framework and legal toolbox is already uh, in play to prevent uh, female genital cutting. Um, it is circumcision rational? Uh, so these are the arguments you hear for it. It's cleaner and it looks better. Uh, it, you know, it's a little bit insulting to think that that we're too stupid to clean our bodies, <laughs> that males are too dumb to know how to clean our, our, our genitals. Um, it looks better. It depends on who you would ask. I would say that someone who, uh, a female that lives in Japan who seldom sees a circumcised penis would not probably say that. But it's the same arguments that's used to justify female genital cu cutting by the cultures that practice it. Um, it's easier when he's young. Um, I mean, any surgery could potentially be easier. It could, you can amputate fingers. That could be easier when, when they're young. It in no way uh, proves that it's an ethical uh, procedure to do. The intact penis is not difficult. The impact pen intact penis is easy to care for, um, as the uh, Finnish cohort shows. And, and the complications from having normal genitals are actually exceedingly rare. Uh, he won't look like other boys. Well, I showed you the demographic trend. 80% of the world's men are intact. Most Canadian men are left intact now. He will look like other boys. He won't look like his father. I don't know about the rest of the males in this room, but I, I didn't really sit around naked too often with my dad staring at each other's penis. Like, when, you know, and I don't remember ever asking him as a kid, when do I get to have part of my penis cut off? But uh, uh, it, it is a concern for some, some patients. And, and I would say, you know, if, if dad had a big scar over his, his right eye, uh, should, 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 should son have that as well? And of, and of course the answer is no. And the last thing, uh, because my talk hasn't been quite controversial enough, um, <laughs> circumcision and religious freedom. So you see this in every part of the world where uh, uh, circumcision bans are proposed. You saw this in San Francisco. We saw this in Cologne. Um, whenever a circumcision ban is proposed, you see immediate pushback from uh, the conservative religious right. And the news stories are always say, you know, this, this, this is an interesting issue. It brings up the conflict between religious freedom and the child's right to physical integrity, right? They always try to make this comparison that there's conflicting uh, human rights at stake here. And I would argue that that's uh, an artific artifactual conflict. I don't think that conflict exists because if your religious beliefs are that, that the creator of the universe wants you to remove part of your penis, then you can do that to yourself, right? But your religious freedom does not allow you to then use your child's body as an arena to, to prove your religious devotion. Your, your religious freedoms end at your own body. They should not extend beyond your own body onto someone else. Um, so I don't think that is truly a religious conflict versus the, the, uh, the rights of the child. Um, 
you know, this, and, and you hear this from religions so often that they're incapable of change, right? That, that uh, they're too rigid, that they, they can never stop doing this. Well, the outfits that, that these um, Hasidic Jewish men are wearing right now, this has nothing to do with ancient Judaism uh, from 3,000 years ago, okay? These are the, this is the traditional outfit worn by the Polish gentry, the, the Polish uh, landowning class from the 1750s. This is a modern outfit. So religions are capable of modernizing and changing. And I think that uh, a larger conversation needs to be had around circumcision, uh, particularly as it relates to uh, religious uh, uh, groups that practice it as well. I'm uh, going to stop here now. Um, and I'd be happy to take any questions, or uh, I'd be happy to hear any disagreements as well, because um, I think that's important for, yeah. First of all, thank you. Uh, that, was a, that was a great talk, very informative. I appreciate it. You had a lot of metaphors that really the point Thanks. Uh, so I speak from the perspective of a, a men's issue focused counselor and something that has become more and more interesting is, is the area of trauma and circumcision grief and while your talk was very upstream it, it, it kind of I think one of its big strengths is educating people on uh, the dangers I wondered, for the people in the room, how many men were sitting around cut, sort of thinking, well, shit. You know, and maybe, so I was, um, I understand your area of medicine is in psychiatry, but your, what are your thoughts on psychological adjustment, or sort of the, the moving forward, just beyond the upstream, if you had anything better? It, it's a, um, th that, that's a difficult, that's a difficult topic, and you know what, there, there's something, there's something called the angry, angry dad syndrome, right? And uh, you, you see this a lot where um, the mother is really against circumcision, but uh, dad happens to be circumcised, and dad insists that, that, that his son's going to be circumcised. No son of mine is going to be walking around. And uh, there, there is a little bit of a psychological block that dad puts up there, right? Um, and I think, you know, it's, it's, it's a... It's a, difficult, it's a difficult block to get through because it's a hard thing being told that you're missing out on something as important as sexual pleasure, right? That's a hard thing to, uh, to have to digest. Um, but, but I think, you know, the, the further understanding that, that people have around the neuroanatomy and the complexity of the structure which is being removed is the best way to communicate to those, those uh, parents, right? Um, not, not, not be, I mean, this is not a, terrible disability that's going to ruin people's, you know, the vast majority of men, it does not ruin their lives, right? But you're talking about something that may uh, give their child a little bit more enjoyment and pleasure. So I, I think it's important to try to sell it as, you know, why wouldn't you want your child to, to have the best possible future sex life that they can have? Um, but it's, I, I don't know if, Kira, if you have anything to add. I mean, it's a very difficult... Uh, yeah, um, I'm actually going to be speaking a little bit to that um, in the presentation that's to come. Um, but I think I'd just like to maybe put this out there now that these conversations are never easy. They really aren't, especially in the culture that we live in. And um, there's often a lot of emotions that are brought up, um, whether it's by seeing a circumcision video or hearing a talk like Chris's or encountering someone protesting on the street and not even realizing at first that this has been inside you all along. Um, but there are therapists that are working with men on this particular issue, and Chris and I would be happy to pass along contact information um, to anyone who feels that they would like to investigate that, um, so we can do that after the presentations. Um, it's, it's not easy, it really isn't, but our hope, and one of the reasons why we're here tonight, is that by us taking responsibility as healthcare providers, um, and saying, you know, we need to have this conversation. 